So, Dr. Holis, welcome to so Inspired Perspectives. Thank you. And Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. We're in Oregon, uh, in Portland, where you'll mm -hmm. be giving a workshop this weekend mm -hmm. on the importance of depth psychology in our time. And I'm curious what has brought you to this point uh, in your understanding of what it is to be human. Certainly. Well, you know, when people ask me what Jungian psychology is about, it's very difficult to explain because there are so many different implications and ramifications. But the thing that I always come back to is that we are meaning-seeking, meaning-creating animals. And more people suffer disconnects from meaning than any other single cause of, of uh, misery in their lives. And it may not be overtly in their face, but it may show up in their relationships, their self-medication, or their depressions, or those moments at three in the morning we, we wake up and we sort of, sort of say, what, what is this all about, you know? And it's in those moments that large questions are being addressed in our lives. And so when people ask about Jungian psychology or depth psychology, I always try to say, well, it's, it's really about trying to raise the question of meaning and purpose in an individual's life. So much of modern psychology, sadly, has um, satisfied itself with important, but at the same time, superficial issues like our behaviors, our thought processes, our biological functions, all of which are important, but you put them all together, you still don't have the whole person. And, and all of us have this very deep, deep need to feel that we belong to something, that what we are doing matters, and that uh, our, our energies are spent in a way that's purposeful. And interestingly enough, we have powerful clues that we knew as children, but we learn quickly to override and, and suppress because we're our creatures of adaptation. So, for example, we can many times find ourselves ambushed by our own feeling function. Or we're doing all the right things, but the energy is not there. Or, or we find ourselves um, doing what we're supposed to be doing, maybe doing it quite successfully. And, and yet there's something inside that's missing. There's no sense of satisfaction or purpose there. I had a wonderful client years ago who was a longtime member of AA, and he said one of the sayings in his group was, this isn't working for me, but I do it very well. Mm -hmm. And I thought that could apply yeah, to any of lots us. Of, yes, know. and lots of um, habits. A that absolutely, we... absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And interestingly enough, in my field, we welcome, and I have to put that in quotes, we welcome psychopathology, unlike any other field, not that we want anybody to suffer, it's just that the psychopathology is the way in which our psyche shows its protest. It shows that it's not happy with whatever the marching orders are, or whatever the plan is, and it will show up in that robbing of energy, or show up in the depression, or show up in the angers or, or those moments of complete emptiness that all of so us experience. So in a sense it's welcoming that as opposed to yeah. it's welcoming those um, arisings. Well um, at, at the very least asking the question why has this come and what is mm -hmm. it asking of me as opposed to how quickly do I suppress it or right. how, how do, right. quickly do I How make, do I get rid of this out of get my life? Yeah. Exactly. How do I medicate yeah. it away or five easy steps to this or that. You know if all the self-help books out there worked why, we'd all be fine. We'd know it. The problem is they don't work because there is a, there's a core within each of us that's far deeper than that that is desperately seeking connection, desperately, de desperately seeking uh, a purpose in life, and, and is constantly expressing its dissatisfaction when we stop and pay attention. Mm -hmm. People don't come into therapy because they were in the neighborhood and wanted to have a chat with a total stranger and tell them their life's problems. It's, it's because they have in some way tried all their strategies and they may fantasize that the therapist has some special insight into oh this is the better way to do that mm -hmm. or here's a better strategy for it and, and sometimes that can be helpful actually but underneath all that is the question of saying but but what does the psyche say and remember the word psyche is the greek word for soul Soul is not something that people talk about with any well, comfort. It's and particularly the, you know, I, I don't know if it was ever thus, but particularly now it seems that there's right. a reluctance. Or when it's talked about, it's talked about as if it's something you could actually purchase off a shelf and unwrap. There's something about it that's popularized. Absolutely. So, 
Absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Once again, it's cheapened mm. <laughs> by pop psychology, or it's ignored by mainstream culture. <laughs> and and the basic message of mainstream culture is try to have a good time, uh, distract yourself as much as you can, and and sort of put off and and repress as much as you can get away with it, and it'll all you know tomorrow's another day kind yeah. of thing. And so these things have to build until something within us says, but there's something missing in my life, something wrong in my life. Uh, and, and until we ask that question of ourselves, we're going to be blaming others. We'll blame mm -hmm. our partners, our children, mm -hmm. our jobs, whatever. All of which are, of course, the arenas in which all of this is playing out. And yet, how easy it is to find causes, to find blame, without ver really ever asking the question, what is really wanting expression through me? That's a different question. Yeah. It's not an ego-driven question. It's actually saying, what is worthy of my service? That's a whole different question. Which requires freedom. It yeah. requires to actually believe that we um, have some degree of autonomy. And, yeah. I, you know, I think many of us feel we don't, we're scared to feel we have that choice. There's a part of us that hides that, even, even though we may be very successful in the eyes of the world. Right. It's a, it's a stunning summons to accountability. If there's any one word I'd want to use today, it's accountability. Mm -hmm. In the end, despite what's happened out there, and we're all creatures of fate and accident and so forth, in the end, we're all accountable for how our life is turning out. Yeah. Who's making the decisions on a daily basis? Where are they coming from in me? What are they making me do? What are they keeping me from doing? Those are questions we're, we're not commonly used to, to asking. But until they're asked, so much of our life is on automatic pilot. I wonder too if, at least in, in my experience, there's, there's something to that expectation that once there's a realization or an awareness of something, that it's totally integrated. And therefore, a lack of patience around of shift. Of course. Well, the two things that I've learned most as a therapist over, say, the last four decades, and I hate them both, frankly, is patience and powerlessness. Powerlessness because, in a sense, I can't fix anybody, but there's something in each person that is self-healing. And secondly, pow uh, patience. You, you have to stick it out. And I just recently wrote a, a blog for the Young Society of Washington, where I live at the, at the time, and uh, it was taking off on a quote from Jung where he said, we don't really solve our problems, the key problems, mm -hmm. but he said we can outgrow them. There's a big distinction there. In other words, it's not like the real issues of life are easily resolved. You'll always be with them. You know, what, what's, the, what's the relationship between what I owe myself and what I owe others? There's no formula for that. You have to work that out in every single life circumstance. And you, you work it out according to where you are at the time psychologically. Mm -hmm. So again, underneath all of this is that summons to awareness and accountability. Without which, I mean, again, it sounds so obvious. Uh, I mean, I could be an adult, have a big body, play big roles in life, and still be in some way driven by infantile motives or, yeah. or complexes or, or trying just to fit in or in, in some way uh, hoping somebody will show up and explain it to me. And all of that's understandable, but it's also a flight from showing up in our lives. Mm -hmm. And there isn't much dialogue to encourage us to be in a process that isn't instantaneous. Your reference to the, you know, the self-help book section and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how many are produced every day, but it's a lot. I've once heard that right. number. And it's almost as if that, um, how popular that is right now, discourages uh, a deeper process, or That's at correct. least to my eyes. Sure. Well, and frankly, uh, the presence of that kind of, of commercialized activity, because that's what's driving it, uh, it comes out of two sources, the decline of traditional religions, which offered mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. frames of reference, um, understandings of self in relationship to the universe, number one. And number two, the bankruptcy of contemporary culture as a set of treatment plans or anodynes. Mm -hmm. So the chief yeah. treatment plan for um, the present culture is materialism, you know, to fill the emptiness inside of you, you go buy something. Distract yourself as much as possible. And when that doesn't work, we have a thousand different forms of anesthetization. 
So all of those in some way are, are super, superficial treatments which again uh, come out of a self-healing motive but, but they only make one's life worse. That's the paradox. So there's a decline in traditional structures that gave us comfort mm -hmm. and secu profound security mm -hmm. and all of that security is taken away. That's right. And then we are looking for something and in many, and with good, I, I would think with many good intentions, people come with a five-step solution or, of course, uh, you know, in many cases it's good intentions and mm -hmm. other cases it, it, it's not obvious that it's good intentions. But, um, so it's making our way as individuals through mm -hmm. that and actually saying, mm -hmm. you know, n n there is something more that I need to reach of that's course. deep within me. And bits and pieces of that may be very helpful to any individual. I'm not denigrating an entire industry. All I'm saying is the fantasy that it feeds, I think, is distracting to people and ultimately deceptive. In the same way that Jung always said that one really needs to explore the riches of mm -hmm. our cultural history, of our religious histories, and there are many great images, many great stories, many great insights into human nature there that are timeless. But you have to go searching for yourself. The, mm -hmm. the difference between today and another era is rather than just receive that package, you are accountable for looking through there to see which are the things that sort of help make sense of my life and which things don't. And if they don't, to have the courage to discard them because otherwise I'm hanging on to baggage that is simply holding me back. Would you argue that that, um, that, that the very fact that the traditional structures have uh, st are starting to dissipate um, suggests that we're being called to be in some way bigger than we were 40 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago or mm -hmm. is it part of human evolution or is it mm -hmm. I, I'm curious, or perhaps we don't even know. I'm, I'm curious your sure. perspective. Well, at the very least, we're asked to be more responsible. In other words, I think what differentiates the experience of the modern and the postmodern from, say, your ancestors or your, your grandparents, mm -hmm. let's say, was authority was found in the collective. And in many cases, people still look to the collective, whether it's popular culture or traditional beliefs or whatever, for their answers. And again, if it works for them, more power to them. Yeah. But if it doesn't, then in a sense, the, the, the responsibility for that is shifted to the shoulders of the individual. In other words, I am accountable for working through you know, the, the plethora of images and ideas and values and so forth that are swarming at all times and, and saying, which ones touch me? Which ones speak to me? So it's like walking into a museum. And there's a painting there that touches you and moves you. And maybe somebody else walks by and they're indifferent. Well, who's right? Mm -hmm. Well, we wouldn't mm -hmm. say, well, this person's right and that person's wrong. We'd say, well, no, they, they have a different sort of, you know, psycho-spiritual apparatus. And one responds to this painting and one responds to that. The same way we do to foods and so forth. And, and it's like the authority for that has shifted from, uh, you know, sacred institutions or, or tribal values to the, the individual, which is a, a grand freedom, mm -hmm. terrifying at times. It's also a kind of um, sort of profound invitation because I think it also contributes to a sense of individual dignity and purpose. In a way that perhaps we didn't have the opportunity to feel no. as fully before. No. When you stop and think about how much people were defined by collective roles, like gender roles, mm -hmm. or e ethnic roles, or socioeconomic roles, or, or religious definitions, it, it can make one weep to realize how yeah. much life was crushed by abstract categories. Pervade perhaps with good intentions, but mm -hmm. you know, but with deleterious effects upon the souls of individuals. And, and so part of what's happened in the modern era over the last really two centuries is the, the shattering of the presumptive authority of those roles. The assumption that they either came from gods mm -hmm. or from, you know, the tribal wisdom. And, 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 and we see them today as they are social constructs that can be deconstructed and what you get after that is in a sense an invitation to your own consideration. There's, so there's, as I, as I listen to you speak here, there's a couple of things that arise for me. One is, is the complexity of putting together one's own 
um, values, if you will, or one's own belief or one's own myth, tradition, what one chooses to uh, live by or to. And then the ability, it feels like it's still a growing edge for us humans to then be in meaningful conversations with people who have a profoundly different viewpoint mm -hmm. that we haven't really mastered that very no. well. No. Any suggestions on the tools towards that? Well, you know, first of all, we have to realize that uh, in terms of evolutionary survival, there's always built into us an ambivalence about the other. Is the other a tiger waiting behind the bush to eat me? Yeah. Is the other hostile and intent? And the single biggest threat to human nature at this point, to human survival, is frankly the fear of the other. Because that, that, that tribal and instinctual fear, which, which served at some level when we're living in nature, mm -hmm. when we're living in mutually interlocked societies can be lethal. Because what it produces is the fractionating of, of people into groups, tribalism. Mm -hmm. And tribalism is something we can't afford today because the tools are too lethal. So and how, what is the way then, what is the path towards reducing that? Any gleanings as to well, what it might be? First of all, the irony here is I have to be able to accept the other that's in me. Sounds maybe simplistic, but Jung's concept of the shadow here is very important because the shadow represents mm. those aspects of myself or of my groups that when brought to consciousness, I want to repudiate or disown and say that's no part of me. And yet, how is it I'm exempt from the whole human project? I'm not. And so I'm, I'm a carrier of that, and, and maybe this other person is as well. So if I can begin to see that what is intolerable in the other is, is also in me, I've already dissolved some of that animosity. Uh, this is not a new idea. You remember Jesus said, you know, I, I can see the speck in my neighbor's eye and miss the log in my own. I mean, that's over two millennia ago. That's recognizing that I projected onto the other what I can't abide in myself. And, and frankly, being able to abide and to accept and, and to dialogue with those aspects of ourselves it, it is a very daunting project. Jung said in a lecture in 1937 at Yale University, he said, you know, th this work is, is not pleasant. That's why so few mm -hmm. people do it. Mm -hmm. You have to say what's wrong in the world is wrong in me. And, and what is wrong in my neighbor is also wrong in me. And, and if I can begin that acknowledgement and that path, you'd be surprised how it begins to dissolve some of the animosity. That underneath we are all in some way in the same boat. And, and as I said, can't afford the lethality of, of this internecine struggle that goes on in, in so many different areas of our culture. As you say that, the other thing that comes up is how it's a combination of uh, personal authority and profound humility. Absolutely. That the two, and when you hear, um, you wouldn't, many people, many, often you wouldn't think those words would go together, that, and yet they, have to coexist. That's right. For that. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. First of all, what we're talking about is the shift of authority from the group mm -hmm. to the soul of the individual or the conscience of the individual. Secondly, is this whole work is humbling. Who wants to be humbled? We mm -hmm. like to be aggrandized. We like to be more in control of our lives. When I reflect on, on my life and my journey, I find myself knowing less than I ever knew being more and more astounded at, at the role the unconscious plays in directing our behaviors, thinking we've avoided this over here because we've gone over here, and you realize, but over here is just another form of that over there. Yeah. I mean, how can you look at that without being humbled by it? And, and that's really the beginning of wisdom, to know you don't know. And I've, I've heard people say, well, I really don't need to look at all this because I know what I think or my values are clear or something like that. Well, it sounds fine, but it's, it's the highest form of ignorance and arrogance because it's not what you think that's going on. It's what's thinking through you and operating unconsciously you don't know about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And by definition, I don't know about the unconscious. And yet it spills into the world day Constantly. in and day out. Yeah not only in me, but in my relationships. So it's like my highest ethical calling to help others is, is to start looking at this in myself. 
Now, I have to believe that you've built up a trust based on your own uh, meeting of the challenges to um, increase your ability to be mm, introspective, vulnerable, um, not know over time. So, so what I'm referring to here is more that sense of the importance of process. At least mm -hmm. I seem to mm -hmm. find this to be true, that mm -hmm. the more I trust then and experiment and find out that then I'm willing to shift more. Sure. So I, I, no, I uh, and yet it seems mm -hmm. uh, a long process. So it's um, mm -hmm. not 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 three years, not you know sort of five years, but it seems a long a sort of a lifetime process well, almost. It, it is attention. a lifetime process. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I think in a very practical way, I, I could say to you today what I could have said decades ago is there something inside of each of us that always knows what's right for us. Mm -hmm. The question is, can you sit with that long enough, rather than being driven impulsively to some resolution, till that becomes clearer? One way of putting it, I like to, to fantasize and say there's a bunch of little people in here working on things downstairs in the solar plexus, you know. And if I put a problem down there, and I think in this way sometimes, they always work on it and they always get mm. back to me. They don't necessarily follow my schedule, but they'll get back to me a week from now, they'll bring me a dream, they'll wake me at three in the morning. There's something inside that knows. And then, all right, first is that insight, but second is the courage to then take it seriously, act on it, and, and thirdly is really persistence, to stick it out over time. Yeah. That's how people actually, when people ask, do people really grow and change, the answer mm -hmm. is yes. But it's, it's rarer than you think, and it's more difficult than you think, because you have to, in some way, not only you know, address this, but stick it out over time. And that's how one moves into a different phase of one's life. Mm -hmm. And it's that it's, it's different than the normal path. So in fact, sure. if we choose that, or any of us who, anyone who chooses that, um, is setting themselves apart in a certain way from popular culture. Of course. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, so, so different from five easy steps to this or that, or 30 days to this or that, because mm -hmm. that's again the imperiled ego state wanting resolution for its comfort. Whereas we're talking about humbling experiences which are far from comfortable for the ego. How about sitting with this and, and feeling miserable for a while? until the purpose of that misery begins to reveal itself to you. Nobody wants to hear that. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. yeah. But that's the only path because without that, you see, one is simply driven by one complex or another. And that's the world. And that's in. the particular problem of the day almost, which we think we can solve in a exactly. pacify in a particular way. So the one th I have noticed that it's useful when I look back in my life or when I uh, talk with clients and they look back in their life just to have that perspective of what actually has been overcome. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, that where I was when I was 18 and the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the tendencies and the deference to this or that and how that's changed. And it seems um, that, that that's useful mm -hmm. uh, as, as encouragement for the path forward, almost. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, sure. I mean, I'm I'm 78 at this point, and uh, at this stage of life, and I have several clients in the, roughly the same stage. One of the things that their dreams are about, and and where things come up for them in the most meaningful way, is you know reviewing their life, saying, mm -hmm. what happened, what did it make me do, what did it keep me from doing, how did I understand it at that time, how do I understand that today. Is there unfinished business there? See, because what that's about is trying to understand what has this journey been about? There will be things there that might appall us or embarrass us or, or cause us heart, grief. Mm -hmm. And yet, that's part of the journey. And, you know, our life is not just a resume. You know, our life is what's been unfolding uh, sort of in, in the shadows, as it were. And you don't really know that. You have to sort of live the journey until you look back and say, well, this is sort of what that's been about. And are there areas where this proposes for me uh, an agenda? For example, mm. 
one of the things we will find is how many times at a certain juncture in our life fear called the shots. Yeah, absolutely. Or lack of permission called mm -hmm. the shots for us. Or coulda, woulda, shoulda. And you say, all right, all right, sometimes those things are never retrievable. But are there places in your life today where there's something in you that is wishing expression or wishing to, to undertake another kind of journey and, and it's like the old fear is there. Now you know what your task is. You have to push through that because look at the cost of that. The hardest death of all is the one where a person says, I, I, I could have done this, I should have done that, um, you know, but I was afraid. And, and as we've all had that. The question is, can I look at that and can I in some way say, all right, and where are, are those issues blocking me today? Because life, life is still going on. And you know, it's also, so that's the action that we can take now in whatever is presenting it to our, as based on our assessment of, of our mm -hmm. self and our tendencies historically. And then it also occurs to me that in truth, when we each, you know, leave this body, that we will have mixed feelings about how well we've done or as we near it, you know, even uh, that that's also inevitable and almost that being able to, there's a preparation in terms of being able to be with that. Of course. No, you're absolutely right. And, and I think one of the hardest things of all is self-acceptance, if you're really honest. Mm. Because there are many things we won't like about ourselves. And yet we have to extend to ourselves um, as, as much generosity that we might extend to somebody else. I always like Paul Tillich's definition of grace. He said, grace is accepting the fact that you're accepted despite the fact that you're unacceptable. We're all unacceptable. You know, we, we, we all make a mess of life. Welcome to the club. Yeah. So it's, uh, and it feels to me as if there's almost a requirement for a certain degree of acceptance of that in order to scratch deeper. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which speaks, I guess, to the, the combination of the courage and the humility as well. But yeah. there is something in the, I may never get this rightness. We never will get it all right. We never <laughs> will figure it out, you know. Life is, you see, and that's another aspect that I've learned along the way, is what was unacceptable to me as a child today is the norm. And that's living with uncertainty and ambiguity. Mm -hmm. I, I, like anybody else, thought if you met the right people, read the right book, traveled the right road, you, you'd know, you'd figure it out. And we learned many interesting things on the road, but in, in the end, the really important questions are always going to be mysteries, and that's what makes the journey interesting. I've often said to people, you know, this is not about fixing you because you're not broken. This is not about curing you. You're not a disease. It's about making your life more conscious more interesting to you. You know, every day is, is high drama. Getting out of the bed in the morning is a high adventure. Now that you're out of bed, what are you going to do with your life? Mm -hmm. Stop and think about that. There is an, you know, there is an, a, to, to use a current word, an awakeness to that as well, because when the definition is in the moment, then yep. there is um, there is a sense of more vitality. We are connected to our whole, you know, more yeah. of ourselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's even in in that embracing or um, the complexity of ourselves and our decision making process and our tendencies, there is a um, more life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 and therefore it feels like more joy. It, I, I agree. Joy not being a fluffy sense, but no, no, something no, else. No, no, exactly right. More dignity, meaning that there's mm. more sense of, yeah, this is my life. I'm taking ownership of it. And I, I think also um, more sense of, you know, that the, the, the rightness of your journey is not whether you get it all right out there. It's like you, you did your best. You, you tried. I have a new motto, uh, eight, a six-word motto that I say to myself every morning as I go to work. It's shut up, suit up, show up. Shut up means, you know, stop whining. You know, you, <laughs> there are people in the world who don't have food today. Yeah, yeah, they don't have absolutely, shelter. Yeah. Their children are being murdered. I mean, you don't have any problems. Shut up, all right? Um, secondly, suit up means, all right, get ready for what life asks of you. Prepare. Pay your dues. You know, mm -hmm. pay your dues. And thirdly, show up, do your best. That's all you can do. You just 
show up, do your best, and that's all life asks of you. Now, why do I have to say that to myself? Well, everybody needs that kind of reminder, you know? Because it's very easy to slip into the old patterns of avoidance, accommodation, unconsciousness, reflexive response, etc., etc. There is also, um, by doing that, there's, there's, I have to believe there's, by and large, for all of us, a deeper sense of satisfaction when we do get to the end of that given day. Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You just do your best, that's all. Because mo many of us were raised with the notion that of perfection, frankly, which is crazy Absolutely, making. absolutely. Crazy making. Yeah. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. and, and the pursuit of it is, is maddening. It's, it's more about, you know, accept the brokenness, accept the partiality, recognize, you know, we're all just, in a sense, struggling. I've always loved the, the, the saying of Philo of Alexandria a couple of millennia ago who said, be kind. Everyone you meet has a really mm -hmm. big problem. That helps to remember that. And we're part of that. So what are the gems for you in terms of the path you've chosen? What have the, the, mm, the gems been in terms of your lived experience, I guess, by having done this, <coughs> made Excuse this me. commitment? Well, first of all, I, I have met some fascinating people, and everybody's fascinating in their way. As a therapist, I have the privilege of sharing the journey with people, which is a profoundly intimate experience, and one that's revelatory. I've learned more from others than they've learned from me. Um, thirdly, um, I, I realized that along the way, there is this, this sort of sense that each of us has a certain kind of life force, a certain kind of mm -hmm. continuity that's at work within us. We can, we can lose contact with it, it can be pushed in this direction or that direction. But, you know, at the end of his memoir, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung reflected on his life. And if anybody could have made grand generalizations, it would have been mm -hmm. Jung. And he said basically, at the end, I'm not certain of anything, except two things. He said, one, that there, there has been a certain continu continuity in my mode of being. In other words, mm -hmm. there's, there, the, the infant you were is the person you are today still, and there's something there that's always been unfolding. And that's not something from our ego or our culture. That's, that's given by the God, so to speak. And, and, and secondly, he said, um, there's, there's just a, a deepening sense that the journey is purposeful and meaningful. And, and that as you try to live that along the way, it brings you enormous rewards. Some of them in the valley of, of suffering, to be sure. Yeah. You know, loss and grieving and so forth. Defeat. And nobody wants to hear that. And at the same time, that's part of the richness of the journey. Yeah, and there is a feeling, at least as I experience it, that meaning is richer than um, anything else I can imagine in life. Sure. Like if I had to, ask for a treasure, we don't sort of publicize it. Meaning is a word perhaps we're not even willing to use a lot of the time in uh, everyday culture. No, and, and it's ironic because having a good time, being happy, these, mm -hmm. are, these are the sort of watchwords of a popular culture, but, but they don't, they're contextual and, and they're very transitory. Meaning is something that persists. And when it doesn't persist, then it's time to look in another direction for it, you see. That, that in a sense, meaning makes life purposeful, it makes it bearable, and it gives you a sense of ongoing challenge. Now, I don't, I can't say I enjoy being a therapist. I find it meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't enjoy necessarily the intensity of that conversation or the pain in which it sometimes entails. I never cease to be experiencing it as meaningful, as meaningless though, yeah. you see. And, and the point is there's a distinction because there's something in us that wants satisfaction, satiety, predictability, even control. Whereas with meaning, you have to always, it's, this is part of that humbling business again, you're always in the presence of something else that's larger than that. And something in us knows that and that's what judges us because Again, when we're off track, something inside of us mm -hmm. always responds through a loss of energy, a loss of purpose, uh, troubling dreams. It always speaks. 
It's coming back to that, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's coming back to that, which is always, always, always there. Recovery yeah. of, of that capacity to dialogue with one's own soul. Sounds so simple. And yet we live in a culture in which that's the most unheard of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a poignancy that, even as you say that, that, uh, that sort of flows through me of, uh, of, that tr of, of treasuring that and making mm -hmm. that supreme in a sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it doesn't cut you off from people. This is not about isolation mm -hmm. or feeling superior to anybody. It, it actually improves the quality of your relationships. I, I, I hope I become less a problem to my neighbor mm -hmm. as a result of that, less a problem to my children, etc. We've, uh, we've gone deep into that value of meaning and in a sense shifting that for an encouragement almost to shift that at least if we want to believe it's possible because I I have to wonder if there are people who don't consider meaning because in fact they wonder if it's even possible you know mm -hmm. whether they and so there's an encouragement to believe in that mm -hmm. if we're going to believe in anything sure and then the truth is you know life sometimes breaks your heart and in many ways people stop asking what really matters and and what, what is it that my journey is about and um, you know that again speaks to that notion that there's something in us that is wishing expression not in a narcissistic way because our job is to help support that now I'm, I'm a card-carrying introvert but my outer life is extroverted which is always at some level costly but the experience is meaningful mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. See, I yeah. travel halfway across, well, across the country, across an, a, a continent, in order to do an extroverted activity tonight to to hundreds of people, actually, and and they seem to feel that it's worthwhile, and and I get it an inherent sense that, you know, this was worth it, because there's a connection there. Mm -hmm. You see, you can't manufacture that. It's it's felt as real or it's not. Yeah. And, and in those moments that you see, that there's, to use an old word there, there's, that's vocation, calling. All of us are called to express something in the world. It doesn't have to be grandiose. It doesn't have to be seen in the public. It's, it's about being who you are. That's your gift. And, you know, it's like the f little poem by Wordsworth back in the 1800. It was his carriage clattering by and he looks down and he sees a little violet there. And he thinks all of eternity has toiled to produce mm -hmm. that violet, you know? And, and what if the world didn't notice? But the violet is still there. That's the point. And our job is to, in some way, embody what is meant to be embodied by the life force through us. With the thousand, thousand uh, obstacles out there and the even tougher ones inside. And yet, when those moments happen, you know it and you add to the richness of things. And they often do involve others too. Or there's often that feeling connection that is mm -hmm. is you is profound in a sure. sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor Hollis, I wanna thank you for taking the time to share with me today. It's it's a privilege and I, I thank you. Wish you well in your work and, and uh, your calling, I think. Yeah. Thank you.